<laughs> oh, that's great. Well, Donna and Debbie going to Israel this month, uh, the 26th. Uh, I do pray for the peace in Jerusalem. I want to make sure she comes back. That, uh, that would be great. Well, uh, today is Palm Sunday. And I know growing up, a lot of you went to churches that they would hand palm leaves out to everyone and sing Hosanna to the highest. And that, uh, that was a tradition in our church, too. And uh, next week for Easter, we're going to have a special Easter service. We're going to study the Thursday through Sunday and we're also going to take communion uh, next Sunday. So we'll, we'll promote that as best we can. But just some verses on Palm Sunday. They're on your outline. Uh, the first, Zechariah, predicting this day. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a coal, the foal of a donkey. And then David wrote in Psalm 118, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. And then two uh, of the Gospels. And I like John because John was standing at the foot of the cross with Mary, Jesus' mother. And Jesus, in his dying word, said, Behold your mother, and mother, behold your son. And John basically took her to his home for the rest of her life. So John 12, 9 to 19. Now, Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead. <coughs> And a great many of the Jews knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. That spread like wildfire, what Christ had done. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also. So they were plotting to kill both of them, Jesus and Lazarus, because on account of his testimony, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. The next day, a great multitude had come to the feast. This is the feast of Passover, which starts this week, Wednesday at sundown. So they're all in Jerusalem. The males had to come three times a year, and this was one of them. And they took the branches of palm trees. And they went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. They were anointing Jesus this day as the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written in Zechariah, Fear not, daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples didn't quite understand these things at first. But when Jesus raised from the dead, they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Therefore, the people who were with him, when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead, became witnesses for this reason the people also met him because they had heard that he had done this sign and the pharisees said to themselves you see you're accomplishing nothing the whole world is gone after him and matthew has an account as well but uh, they were anointing Christ, and a week later, he was crucified. It's hard to believe. It really is. But we do it to him ourselves. 
one day we'll be praising and glorifying Christ. And then the next day we may forget all about it and drop back into the world. So remember the lesson learned from this. Now today we're going to study 2 Kings 9 and 10. And last week we learned that Elisha prophesied the end to the famine. The Syrians were scared to death and left everything. And our Heavenly Father blesses his children through windows of heaven. And those who are blessed with salvation through Jesus Christ are obligated to share the good news. Don't just keep it to yourself. And God keeps his covenant promises even through the worst of times. And that was true for Judah, the Shumanite woman whose son was raised to life, and the believers in Christ today. Jack, I like what you said about praying for the nation. Because I wrote a letter again this week to the newspapers, and they didn't publish it yet. Maybe they will. But I said in the letter, with the events that are taking place, indicting a sitting president, a former president, to get him out of politics. And then when the whistleblower is testifying to Congress, the IRS are showing up at his home and leaving business cards said, we'll be back on Monday. And I said, it's official now. The great United States, the land of the free, is becoming a banana republic where you can intimidate your political opponents through the Justice Department. And people are scared to death of the IRS. <laughs> I, I uh, read where in today's paper that uh, they've already hired 5,000 new employees. And I know they're a lot more efficient because uh, we filed our taxes on Thursday electronically through our CPA, and the money was out of my account on Friday. Last, last year, it took three or four weeks. So be careful. Pray for the nation. And in the scripture, Philippians, God gave you honor, not only in believing in Christ, but suffering for him, which brings glory to Christ. He said, you'll be persecuted for my name's sake. And if things continue in this manner, you won't be able to teach the scripture accurately. It'll be considered hate speech. That, that could come in our lifetime. So where we are, we're going to do chapters 9 and 10. We're going to study the life of Jehu. Now, Jehu is an interesting person. <clears throat> he was the commander of Ahab's army. But God's going to use him to do what Elisha had predicted, and Elisha had predicted. They're going to rid Israel of Baal worship. And I can tell you this. If this was rated, this would be an R-rated lesson because it gets quite bloody. But uh, that's the way things were, and that's the way things are at times today. But Elisha the prophet called one of the sons of the prophets and said, Take this flask of oil, and I want you to get to Ramoth Gilead. And when you arrive there, look for Jehu the son of Jehoshaphat. Now, Jehoshaphat was king of the southern kingdom, Judah. But this is his son, who's working for the northern kingdom. There was a lot of interaction, even through these divided kingdoms. And it says, the son of Nimshi. Now, in the Bible, they count grandfathers and grandkids as sons. So, that, that's his grandfather, his Nimshi, Jehoshaphat's his father. And get him up and talk to him away from the other people in the inner room. And you take this flask of oil. And you say to him, thus says the Lord, 
I have anointed you king of Israel. And then open the door and get the heck out of there because you're not going to know how the others are going to feel. So, a young man does what he's told, goes to Ramoth Gilead, and he knocks on the door of the commanders and says, I have a message for you, commander. And Jehu said, well, which one? There are a few of us here in the room. He said, for you. And then he arose and went into the house and poured the oil on his head and said to him, thus says the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed you king of the people of Israel. You, you Jehu, shall strike down the house of Ahab, your former boss, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. Jezebel executed all the godly prophets. She had them all killed. And this is going to be God's vengeance upon the whole house of Ahab. The whole house, everybody, is going to perish. From all the males, both bond and free, I'll make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam and Basha desolate. Those descendants won't exist. They'll be gone. And the dogs will eat. Jezebel, on the plot of ground of Jezreel, and there'll be no one to bury her. There's not going to be enough left of her to be buried. And then he opened the door and fled, and I wrote in my Bible, what a mess. <laughs> Can you imagine hearing this? And Jehu came out to the other servants and the other commanders. And they said, hey, is everything okay? Why, why does this this madman come to you? What did he say? You know the man in his babble? And he said, no, tell us exactly what he said. And thus and thus he spoke to me, saying, Thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. Now their reaction was great. It's just like Palm Sunday. And each man hastened to take off his coat and lay it before Jehu and anoint him and blew the trumpets and said, this is a great choice. Jehu is king. And then page four, I wrote, this is the BBB. This is the beginning of bloody business. And it's going to come. So Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, conspired against the current king of Israel. He's going to take his place. Now, Joram, or Jehoram, Joram is just short for Jehoram. He got wounded by the Syrian king, Haziel, which uh, is in power in Syria. And Joram comes home to lick his wounds. And he's going to rest. And Jehu said, don't let anyone let this word out. Don't tell anyone. Uh, for I, I'm going to go to Jezreel where Joram's recuperating. And he rode in his chariot where Joram was laid up. And the king of Judah had come to help Storm to see how he was doing. So you got the two kings, the north and the south. And the watchman stood in the tower, and he saw a company of Jehu, and he cried out, Hey, I see a whole bunch of folks coming this way. And Joram said, Well, get on a horse and ride out and see, is it peaceful? And so the horseman went out. And said uh, to Jehu, the king says, uh, do you have good intentions here? And Jehu said, uh, what do you have to do with whether I'm going to have peace? Get in line with us. And so the messenger went to them. The watchman reported, but he's not coming back. They still haven't. So he said, let's send another one. And the same thing happened. He put him in line behind Jehu. 
So the watchman reported that, and he said that he's not coming back either. And the guy leading this pack is driving like a madman. I think it's Jehu. He's driving furiously, kind of like Ben Hur. He is just pounding the horses, heading <coughs> to the city. And Jerome said, well, let's get everything ready and we'll go out and see him. So both kings go out to meet Jehu. And when he saw Jehu, he said, hey, buddy, uh, is this a, a good time to visit? Are we having peace here? <coughs> and Jehu says, what peace? As long as the harlotries of your mother, Jezebel, this is Jezebel and Ahab's son. And her witchcraft is many. And Joram goes, I'm getting out of here. And so I wrote my Bible, uh-oh. And he said to a hazy guy, the other king, it's treachery. Let's get out of here. So Jehu takes his bow. And he probably was a strong fellow. And with his full strength, he shot Jehoram, the king of Israel, between his arms. <coughs> and the arrow came out at his heart, and he sank down in the chariot. So he shoots him in the back. And Jehu said to Bidkar, here's what I want you to do. Throw him in that field that Ahab and Jezebel stole the vineyard from Naboth, the Jezreelite. For remember, hey, we were riding for Ahab, and the Lord told Ahab, that's what's going to happen. So I saw the blood of Naboth and the blood of his son, and the Lord said, I will repay you for this dirty plot. Therefore, Take him and throw him in that plot of ground according to the Lord. So that's one king down and one to go. Now, when Ahaziah, the king of Judah, saw this action, he saw his buddy get shot right through. He turned around and fled. And Jehu said, Go get him. Pursue after him. And they shot him too. And then he's wounded. And he fled to Megiddo and died there. <coughs> and the servants carried him back to Jerusalem. So he did get buried in Jerusalem where he belonged. And Ahaziah had become king over Judah. And now his mother... <coughs> Excuse me, these allergies are terrible. Athalia takes over as the queen. Now when Jehu came to Jezreel, Jezebel had heard this story. Both kings killed. So what does she do? She gets all dolled up. She puts paint on her eyes, put on fancy clothes. She knows she's probably going to die today but she's very vain, and she wants to look good. <clears throat> so she looks out the window, and as Jehu entered the gate of the city, she takes an insult to him and calls him Zimri. Now, if you remember, Zimri was a former king that was a traitor. And she said... Uh, Zimri, is it you? Is it peace? You murderer of your master. You murdered the king. It's like she was calling him Benedict Arnold. You dirty traitor, you Benedict Arnold. So Jehu looks up at the tower she's in. And he said, who's on my side? Who's going to work with me? And... Two or three eunuchs looked out. They always had eunuchs around the queen. So there was no hanky-panky. So he said, who's on my side? 
throw her down, throw her out the window. And so they threw her down <coughs> and the blood splattered on the wall and on the horses. So what does Jehu do? He runs back and forth over her body with his chariot. That's how much he hated her. And I said to uh, Dennis Prager, anybody listen to Dennis Prager? A few people. We had a, a dinner with him and I, he was taking questions. And I said, uh, you're an Old Testament scholar. He is, by the way. He's author of Old Testament Bible now. I said, when President Trump beat Hillary Clinton, was that kind of like King Jehu riding over Jezebel with his chariot? <laughs> and Dennis Prager goes, that's the kind of question we don't put on the air. <laughs> so Jehu finished up, I'm hungry now. And he goes in and eats and drinks. And he said, go see to this accursed woman. You know, she, she was a king's daughter. So they went to bury her. She was the daughter of a Phoenician king, not an Israeli king. She was the daughter of a Phoenician pagan king who worshiped Baal. So when she came into Israel through the marriage, she brought Baal worship all through Israel. And God hates people that lead other people to sin. And that's what she was the best at. So they went down to Barrier. But they couldn't find much of her left. Just her skull, her feet, and the palms of her hand. Must have been Palm Sunday. <laughs> and they came back and told her, this is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant, Elijah. So... Jehu knew what Elijah was talking about and preaching on the plot of ground at Jezreel, Naboth's plot that they stole from him and had him murdered. The dog shall eat the flesh of Jezebel. And the corpse of Jezebel seed will be as garbage. Because I don't want her to have a place that says, here lies Jezebel. I, she's not going to have a grave. We don't want this to come back and spread. And then chapter 10, Ahab's 70 sons kill. Ahab must have been fairly fertile, I would say, but that also includes grandsons. Okay, so it's Seventy sons and grandsons come on. And Jehu, he's working on this plan to do what God told him to do. Get rid of them all. And Jehu wrote letters to Samaria and to those who were raising these sons. He said, as soon as this letter comes to you, and you have weapons of war, you have chariots and horses. Choose the best qualified and come on out and let's have a fight. Let's have a battle. And they were scared to death. See, they had just heard that Jehu had killed both kings. You know, I don't know how the word got around so fast, but it did. And they were exceedingly afraid and they said, look, two kings couldn't stand up to him. Two kings. How can we stand? So whoever was in charge of the house and those that reared the sons sent a letter back to Jehu. Said, Dear Jehu, we are your servants. Hey, we're going to work for you. We're loyal to you. We'll do whatever you tell us to do, but we're not going to make anybody king here. Do what is good in your sight. Do whatever you want. So Jehu writes, a second letter and he says okay you're working for me and obeying what I want done take the heads off all 70 and bring them to me in baskets 
to the city in Jezreel. And the great men of the city who were rearing them, when they read that letter, they said, okay, we got to do what he says. And they slaughtered 70 persons and put their heads in baskets and sent them to Jezreel. They obeyed Jehu out of fear. This guy is coming on strong. Then a messenger came and told them they brought the heads of the king's sons. And Jehu says, put them in two piles at the entrance of the city. Let everybody see them at the entrance until morning. So he went out in the morning and he stood out and starts making a speech to the people. And he said, you know, you guys are supposed to be righteous. Well, I indeed, I sinned. I conspired against my master and killed him. But who killed all these? And now that nothing shall fall to the earth of the word of the Lord, which the Lord spoke concerning the house of Ahab, whatever God says will be fulfilled. It will come to pass. The Lord has done what he spoke of by his servant, Elijah. Elijah prophesied this. So Jehu killed all who remained of the house of Ahab in Jezreel. He wiped out everybody that was related, his friends, his Baal priests, and killed them all until there were none remaining. So be careful who you make friends with. It can come back to bite you. And the Hazeites, now this is the king of Judah, the south, who Jehu did away with. And he arose and departed and went to Samaria. And on the way at Beth Echid, the shepherds, he met a group of people. And he said, who are you guys? And they said, uh, hey, we're brothers of Ahazi, and we've come to greet the sons of Ahab and the queen mother Jezebel. We love those guys. So he said, take them alive. They took them alive and then executed them all, 42 men, and left none alive. I told you this was already. <laughs> now the rest of Ahab's family is killed. There's not going to be any descendants anywhere. And when he departed from there, he met Jehonadab, a son of Rechab, coming to greet him. And Jehu says, hey, I like you. Do you like me? Is your heart right as my heart is towards you? Do we have this friendship? And Jonah, Jonadab said, yes. Yes, we're good. And Jehu said, give me your hand. Come on up on my chariot. And he took him in. And he said, I'm going to show you my zeal for the Lord. I am a one-man wrecking crew for the Lord. And so they had him ride in the chariot. And he came to Samaria. And he got rid of everybody in Ahab's descendants in Samaria till he had destroyed them according to the word of the Lord which he had spoken to Elijah and then Jehu is going to take care of the worshipers of Baal now Baal worship is synonymous with satanic worship it is evil they do horrible things in their worship. And Jehu gathered all the people together. Now I'm going to tell you a little story. Ahab served Baal a little bit. But Jehu will serve him much. I'm going to be a big Baal guy. And he's lying. He is going to come up with this plan. To get all the Baal worshippers together. Therefore call all the prophets of Baal. All his servants, all his priests, let nobody miss. I'm going to have a feast and a great sacrifice 
to this pagan god Baal. Whoever is doesn't come, you're going to die. So that's a pretty good invitation. You either come or you die. I have a great sacrifice for Baal. But Jehu acted deceptively with the intent of destroying the worshipers of Baal. And he said, we're going to have a solemn worship assembly for Baal. And they proclaimed it all through Israel, throughout the whole land. And all the worshipers of Baal came to the temple of Baal. Satan imitates God. And Baal worshipers imitated the temple in Jerusalem. They built a temple to Baal. And it was full from one end to the other. And he said to one in charge of their wardrobe, they would wear a certain clothing, probably like you see in devil worship ceremonies, all black with the hoods and all that. But he said, I want them all to have a uniform. Bring out vestments for the worshipers of Baal. <coughs> so they brought out special garments for all the Baal worshipers. And that's to identify them. He wants to be able to know who he wants to kill. And Jehu and Jehonadab went into the temple of Baal. And he said, let's really go through this crowd and make sure there's no servants of Jehovah here, but only the worshipers of Baal. So they went in to offer sacrifices. And Jehu has appointed for himself special forces. He's got 80 of the top people picked out on the outside. And he said, if any of these Baal worshipers escape, it'll be your life for theirs. If you let any of them get out, we want to eradicate this sin permanently. It's kill or be killed. Now it happened as soon as he made an end to the offering, again, a burnt offering to Baal, that Jehu said to the guard and the captains, go wipe them out. Go clean house. And they killed him with the edge of the sword. Then the guards and the officers threw him out. <coughs> and they went into the inner room of the Baal temple. The so-called Holy of Holies of this Baal temple. And they tore down the sacred pillars. And made a refuse dump and burned them. They broke down the sacred pillar of Baal, and they tore down the whole temple. So not only did they eradicate these worshipers, they tore the whole thing down. And it's made a refuse, the temple of Baal, a refuse dump to this day. So Jehu destroyed Baal from Israel. He got rid of it. So far, he's doing exactly what was asked. Now, Jehu was a conflicted personnel. He got rid of the Baal worship, but he didn't quite turn away from the sins of Jeroboam. Remember, Jeroboam had made the two golden calves so people wouldn't have to go down to the temple to worship. They could come to these two cities with the golden calves, which was what they did in Egypt, you know, centuries before. So he didn't do it all. He took and kept the golden calves that were at Bethel and Dan. And the Lord said to Jehu, you know, you've done a lot of Good things for me here today. You got rid of Ahab's house, his descendants. You got rid of the Baal worship. And because you did that, your sons shall sit on the throne of Israel 
through four generations. You're going to have a legacy. But Jehu took no heed to walk with the Lord God with all his heart. He gave part of himself to God, part of himself to the world. He was partly godly, partly worldly. And that's very common today. And I wrote my Bible, Matthew 6, 24, when Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. Because you'll either love one and despise the other, or despise one and love the other. You can't be conflicted or double-minded. And so the blessing is going to start evaporating from Jacob. In those days, the Lord began to cut off parts of Israel. And that Syrian king, Hazael, conquered parts of the land, broke them up. Gilead, Gad, Reuben, Manasseh, <clears throat> which is by the river Arnon. And Hazael is starting to really come after the children of Israel. And you remember when Elisha said, you're going to be king? But he was crying. He was weeping because he knew what this guy, Hazael, was going to do to the children of Israel. And so Jehu rested with his fathers, and they buried him in Samaria. And Jehoaz, his son, came and reigned in his place. <coughs> In the period that Jehu reigned over Israel and Samaria was 28 years. So he had a pretty good run. He did what the Lord told him, but he didn't do it with his whole heart. He was uh, what they call today a carnal Christian. <laughs> you know, they love God a little bit, but they love the world a lot. So it's back and forth. And what we learned, the anointing of Jehu by Elisha, to become king was God's plan to rid Israel of the murderous queen Jezebel, who killed the Lord's prophets and the whole house of Ahab, and vengeance will be dealt out by the Lord God Almighty. Leaders who persist in encouraging and advocating sin to their people will be judged harshly because they have a stricter responsibility. Leaders do. Nothing that a leader like our president is doing goes unnoticed. It is part of God's format for being in charge because it can absolutely affect the whole nation. And then generational curses like idol worship, evil habits, dishonesty, Anger and hate can be broken, but only through the power of Christ and the Holy Spirit. He has the ability to change people's hearts. And that's what his work this week. This is a tremendous Holy Week when we realize what God did for us. For he loved us so much, he sent his only begotten son. And whosoever believeth in him is just not going to perish, but will have everlasting life. So have a wonderful week. We'll see you at Easter. If anybody has questions, comments, yes. Right. Yeah, they had teamed. They had teamed up together because they thought alike. <laughs> yeah, and they were equally. So that those and anointed one for Israel, but again, they're still divided because they're still divided. Yeah. Because they want to be the leader. They're still divided, but they do interact a lot. Yeah. You know, it's uh, it's a lot of back and forth. Depends who's a righteous king. Northern Kingdom never had a completely righteous right. king. So South Judah had a few. Good. Any other questions, comments? Who are you rooting for tomorrow night? <laughs>
<laughs> not San Diego. <laughs> All right, let's go to our Heavenly Father. Father, we're grateful for this week. We thank you that uh, after over 2,000 years, you still have the great effect of giving us hope for eternal life through the shed blood of Christ. Your plan was one that people marveled at. They thought they had rid the world of Jesus and his followers. But because of the cross, it has defeated Satan, defeated death, defeated evil. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for being our redeemer, blessed redeemer, who led us to that in our hearts. Thank you. In your holy name, I pray. Amen. Amen. We'll see you next week. Have a nice Passover Wednesday night.